to understand and very easy to complete. Uh, I will deal with the, the other uh, contents like uh, gastrointestinal system uh, obstructions and uh, abnormalities of the gastrointestinal tract tomorrow because uh, it takes a lot of time uh, to understand uh, those techniques there. And the radiographic features are quite difficult when compared to these chapters. So we will try to complete uh, this chapter today, right? So we're going to start with the recognizing the abnormalities of uh, pancreas and the liver, okay? So first we will learn about a few things uh, in the pancreas section, uh, we are going to learn about uh, pancreatitis and pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And then in the hepatobiliary abnormalities, we are going to learn about some of the liver's general consideration. And then we're going to learn about uh, fatty infiltration, cirrhosis disorders, space occupying lesions, such as metastasis, hepatocellular carcinoma, cavernous hemangioma, and hepatic cysts. And then finally, we're going to deal with the, the biliary system as well. So this is fairly a very, uh, you know, a very small chapter. Uh, the technique may be uh, difficult for this uh, uh, chapter, but still the radiographic features seem to be very, uh, you know, easy to understand, very easy to recognize. And a diagnosis can be made instant. But uh, when compared to the pathophysiological mechanisms, yes, uh, these parts are uh, technically a little bit higher uh, and complicated, but uh, the radiographic features are quite easy to understand. So let's start with the uh, pancreas first. Okay, pancreatitis. Okay, so uh, first thing you have to understand one thing. Uh, a very, very fairly common disease that actually comes down into a clinical setup uh, almost every day uh, inside the OP or every day inside the emergency department is uh, pancreatitis. So pancreatitis uh, is generally known as uh, the inflammation of the pancreas, okay? Pancreas is a mixed gland. It's an endocrine as well as the exocrine glands which actually plays a very, very important role in the digestion and also in the metabolism, okay? So uh, the exocrine function uh, is uh, related down to digestion, whereas the endocrine function is related to metabolism by the secretion of insulin by the islets of Langerhans cells, right? So doesn't matter whatever the kind of origin uh, it is, but uh, this, Argon is also more liable to get inflamed within the time. And uh, the most two common reasons for pancreatitis is alcoholism and gallstones, all right? Uh, but still, you have to understand, in an OP setup, uh, pancreatitis is most of the times, most of the times, uh, because of the sedentary lifestyle we have adapted, so pancreatitis, the most common cause of pancreatitis is always alcoholism. But uh, yes, not everybody consumes alcohol, uh, but uh, most of the times, some people are also liable to produce uh, pancreatitis uh, because of uh, the presence of the gallstones. Gallstones is nothing but also known as uh, cholelithiasis. Okay, presence of uh, calcium or mixed type of stones or cholesterol type of stones inside the gallbladder, right? So polylithiasis along with alcoholism seems to be fairly, uh, you know, one of the most common reasons uh, for presence of pancreatitis. So inflammation of the pancreatic tissue leading to the disruption of the ducts uh, most probably uh, you know, it is speaking about the ducts, uh, something like the pancreatic duct. And the spillage of these pancreatic juices, okay, into the surrounding viscera occurs readily because of the lack of capsules surrounding the pancreas. So making out the complex pathophysiological mechanism that is involved with the pancreatitis, 
uh, we can actually say something that the spillage of the pancreatic juices because there is no presence of a capsule surrounding the pancreas seems to be one of the most important pathophysiological mechanism that is involved with this inflammatory response. Uh, while I'm talking about the radiographic features, yes, maybe I will try to introduce you to a little bit of uh, pathophysiology that is related down to pancreatitis. But first understand, it's a very, very simple uh, equation that uh, yes, there is, there will be some kind of inflammation and the inflammation is going to disrupt the ducts. And then this disruption of the normal physiology will eventually lead down to production of increased amounts of pancreatic juices. So which will be visualized on a radiograph. Okay, particularly speaking, you have to remember one, uh, good thing about the pancreas is that remember pancreas is the only organ in the abdomen that is most suitable for an examination on a ct okay uh, liver also plays a very very uh, you know a fairly enough uh, chance to be visualized on a uh, ct scan but still you have to remember uh, for any kind of abdominal tomographic imaging, which means to say there are two modalities involved. One is MRI and other is uh, CT scan. So pancreas is the organ that is actually most suitable uh, in the whole abdomen for any kind of tomographic uh, visualization. Because uh, even this is a soft uh, tissue structure, but fairly, uh, CT scan has got better orientation and better visualization of the pancreas. So uh, do not forget uh, that pancreatitis or any kind of a disease of a pancreas can be fairly diagnosed on a CT scan and an MRI, uh, which uh, the investigation of choice first will be a CT scan. All right. So what actually happens, we have to know something about uh, pancreatitis before we go into the radiographic features. So pancreatitis is fairly a clinical diagnosis with the CT serving to document either the cause of gallstones or either the cause of complication. So for example, to say that if there is a pseudocyst formation, uh, which we call it as pancreatic pseudocyst, okay, PPC, we call it as, and yes, to rule out all other conditions that is actually causing this inflammation, uh, we have to go down with a uh, CT scan. So pancreatitis is first actually assessed down in an emergency clinic or it is uh, assessed down in an OP clinic based on the clinical scenarios. So uh, let me tell you something about the clinical scenario, how does a patient actually present up with, okay? Um, since we know that actually the patients are actually coming down with the history of alcohol consumption or sometimes with the history of gallstones, so we have to understand one thing that, uh, uh, let me give you a clinical scenario. A patient of uh, let's say 32 year old male comes down to the clinic with a complaint of uh, mid epigastric pain that has been aggravating for the last one hour, okay? Uh, a 32 year old male comes down to a clinic uh, with a complaint of mid epigastric pain that has been aggravating for the last one hour. He has a sensation of uh, vomiting, okay? He has uh, projectile vomiting, uh, where there also he seems to be complaining of a little bit of respiratory distress. And uh, uh, what do you say? We can say that he is acquiring a position of uh, prostration. Okay, I think uh, you know prostration. Prostration is nothing but uh, flexing down your knees onto your chest. Okay, that is actually called as a position of prostration. So he comes down to uh, the presence of the clinic because he's been winding up with pain uh, over the 
epigastric region. So now a doctor, generally anybody uh, coming down to a uh, clinic with a complaint of mid gastric pain, um, what are the differential diagnosis would you will be thinking of first? Okay, please tell me what is the differential diagnosis? Any kind of a patient that is coming down with uh, epigastric pain, what could be the differential diagnosis first we should be thinking about? Okay, gastritis, then. Pancreatitis, okay, more. Hepatitis, okay, more. Okay. Now, see, uh, Aman, the condition, what you're talking about, appendicitis, you see appendicitis uh, is uh, generally presented down as the periumbilical pain or the epigastric pain only when the position of the appendix is higher. Okay, only the higher level appendicitis actually generally presents down uh, that way. Uh, one of the most important uh, differentiating feature in case of pancreatitis is that the pain is more concentrated down onto the left side, okay, left hypochondrium. And also, most of the times, the pain usually radiates to back, okay? Uh, the pain is usually radiating to the back, and there will be a clinical sign that is called as the Murphy sign, okay? which is called as the Murphy's sign, okay? Murphy's sign is uh, generally, uh, you know, mentioned down as the cessation of respiration upon palpation of the liver or the pancreas regions, okay? Cessation of respiration, or particularly to say that there will be a lot of pain during inspiration and the patient will actually will try to stop the respiration. So which means to say when he's trying to take down the air in, which eventually pushes the diaphragm down, and also uh, the patient's uh, gallbladder, uh, the, the liver will be pushed down. Eventually the gallbladder will be palpation. Well, that is where you hold your uh, hand. And clearly the patient will actually get the more pain and he will stop down to inspire. So that is actually called as Murphy's sign. So cessation of respiration upon palpation of the abdomen is actually called as a Murphy's sign. So this is the first clinical uh, presentation that uh, you have to think about. Okay, I have to consider down a diagnosis of a pancreatitis. Well, do not ever forget to ask about a clinical history where you have to see if the patient has consumed alcohol where this pain started to aggravate okay that is the first thing we actually have to ask the patient okay if there was any acute consumption of alcohol and also the type of alcohol and the amount of alcohol also attributes to uh, you know the presence of the inflammation uh, in the pancreas. But uh, you have to understand there are some other conditions uh, other than alcoholism and gallstones, which also causes pancreatitis. The most important infection that actually causes pancreatitis is mumps. Okay, remember, it's a very important thing. Okay, pancreatitis can also happen in other people who do not have any kind of a relation. Uh, down to alcoholism or gallstones, but it can also happen in people that have been an infection of the parotid gland, which is actually called as mumps. Okay, 
and there are some of the drugs uh, which also cause pancreatitis the most important drugs that actually causes pancreatitis is amantadine amantadine okay valproate valproate and azathioprine okay azathioprine right these are the three drugs which also can cause the pancreatitis but you have to understand doesn't matter what kind of an etiological factor it is but uh, the inflammation of the pancreas generally happens by auto digestion of pancreas by an enzyme known as trypsinogen okay so you have to understand one thing that there will be auto digestion of the uh, pancreas by enzyme trypsinogen okay trypsinogen is uh, trypsinogen is the digestive enzyme okay which actually causes the auto digestion okay particular digestion since the uh, you know the pancreas is not covered by any capsule so the increased amounts of the production of trypsinogen will actually cause the auto digestion which the process is actually called as auto lysis okay auto lysis so uh, fairly you have to uh, see one thing that the most important culprit that is responsible for the uh, auto digestion or for causing the inflammatory reaction of a pancreas is nothing but your trypsinogen. <coughs> uh, let me uh, arrange my writing pad so that I can explain to you what exactly I'm talking about. Okay, uh, can everybody see the screen? See the whiteboard? Please respond. Yes, okay. So remember, let me recall back one once again. Pancreatitis. Okay, pancreatitis, the causes are alcoholism. Okay. And then gallstones. Then we have mumps and fairly three drugs, uh, which is like amantadine, okay, valproate, and as a Open. Okay, so these are the ones, and it will be happening because of the auto lysis by trypsinogen. Okay, so this is uh, what you have to remember here. So auto lysis by trypsinogen, but uh, there is a uh, 
uh, there is a you know a pathophysiological mechanism but we will actually see I, w I was telling you before that the diagnosis of the pancreatitis is mostly clinical but uh, when you have a history of like this one we will be tr uh, we will be you know suspecting down uh, the pancreatitis uh, in a fair way but uh, but what actually happens what is the clinical evidence that you actually have or uh, in this setup uh, to confirm that it, it is happening because of uh, pancreatitis that is first we will know and then we will forget that one actually has to lead down to your suspicion down of forwarding the patient down into a you know a ct scan examination so the thing that actually happens down is okay there is a trypsinogen okay there is this trypsinogen which will be converted down to trypsin okay which will be converted down to trypsin with an enzyme presents which is nothing but your endero peptidase okay trypsinogen actually converts down into trypsin okay which is happening because of the presence of endero peptidase and in then it will eventually be converted down into or broken down into a two more enzymes which is nothing but your amylase and lipase okay which is eventually broken down into nothing but two more enzymes like amylase and lipase in pancreatitis what actually happens is that there will be a premature okay premature activation okay premature activation of enteropeptidase okay premature <laughs> activation of enteropeptidase which eventually lead down to the activation and finally production of amylase and lipase which are nothing but the inflammatory okay inflammatory mediators here okay so whenever a doctor in a clinical setup actually suspects about pancreatitis the first uh the first thing that actually a doctor notice uh notices is that there will be a sudden rise of the amylase and the lipase enzymes in the laboratory results okay so this one has to lead down to a very very critical suspicion that the patient is going to suffer from pancreatitis well but uh, generally you know there will also be some other conditions that actually rise down the levels of amylase and uh, uh, lipase but fairly the most common region, uh, reason that actually is because of pancreatitis so let me recall back the clinical scenario once again and tell you what exactly it looks like. Okay, a 32-year-old male comes down to a clinic with a history of alcohol consumption, presents down with the epigastric pain that has been radiating down to the back and aggravating for the last one hour. So immediately what should strike down into our mind? The first thing that actually has to strike down into our mind is not gastritis, it's not epigastritis is not pickles or disease or appendix but it actually has to say that there is a fairly enough chance that actually the trypsinogen premature actination of enteropeptidase has happened and you have to think about pancreatitis so once you rule out the pancreatitis then yes you can actually think about some other <clears throat> uh, clinical conditions so what actually happens in this clinical scenario that there will be rising of amylase okay there will be fairly high rise of amylase and there will be a threefold rise of lipase okay remember there will be there will be there will be a amylase uh, enzyme uh, rise and there will be also threefold rise of lipase then 
the most important hint actually you need to see is that acute abdominal pain that is radiating to the back okay just remember so these three most important criteria should suggest you that you have to forward the patient down to a ct examination okay so remember acute abdominal pain that is radiating to the back and with a level of amylase and threefold rise of lipase has to actually you know tell that the patient might be suffering from pancreatitis and you have to confirm such kind of diagnosis on a ct scan okay so the ct scan is not only specific and sensitive but it is also a gold standard and also the immediate investigation of choice okay but which one is much more specific uh the thing is that lipase is the enzyme that actually the threefold rise in the lipase enzyme is the one that is more specific in a laboratory uh, scenario but uh, in a radiological uh, point of view yes ct scan is the gold standard and the confirmation will also be done by the laboratory test okay but uh, generally speaking we need to wait down for the laboratory results which is a very a fairly a long time process for example to say we need to wait for another hour but ct scan is instantaneous because it can be taken down the patient can be transferred down to the radiological department in a setup which has got better facilities so the patient can be transferred down to a ct department immediately and the scan can be taken down within 10 seconds and the diagnosis can be made instantaneously so fairly speaking so that's the reason ct scan appears to be gold standard here but in the laboratory in the clinical diagnosis the gold standard one is three times increase of lipase okay that is what you have to remember and but there are also some other uh clinical signs but actually a doctor recognizes if that they is a patient of uh, pancreatitis okay does anybody has an idea okay one i think i told you that is there is murphy sign but there are some other two other signs uh, which actually also uh, that you can think about uh, uh, you know uh, pancreatitis as well okay cullen sign that is a very good answer okay well what what is meant by cullen sign What is meant by Kalen's sign? What is meant by Kalen's sign? Uh, okay, bruising. Bruising, is it something that because of somebody is beating you? Somebody is causing you a blunt injury? Is it something that way? Or what exactly do you define? How do you? exactly recognize a cullen sign well cullen sign is nothing but bruising okay bruising around umbilicus around umbilicus with oh sorry without no trauma okay generally without no trauma sorry without trauma not without no trauma so bruising periambelicus uh, uh you know bruising okay a, a, let us say it's a, a bluish to blackish discoloration around the umbilicus so which is actually called as a cullen sign and there is another sign that is also called as yes uh, that is correct. There is thing that is called as the Gray Turner's sign. Okay, Gray Turner's sign. Well, actually, it is about the discoloration, discoloration of the flanks. Okay, Cullen's sign 
is the periumbilical bruising or the discoloration around the umbilicus, whereas the gray Turner sign is nothing but the discoloration of the flank, so which is also the bruising around the flanks. Flanks is nothing but your right lumbar region and the left lumbar region. So this is actually visualized by the doctor. But actually, you have to understand here that the presence of a Cullen sign and a gray Turner sign usually is a sign of complication under an emergency. OK, so uh, can Jepalina tell me what exactly this Cullen sign and gray Turner sign is representing? What is the presence or the positivity of the Cullen sign and gray Turner sign actually indicate the doctor to? <coughs> So what is it that the doctor was thinking when he actually had uh, this both positivity of Cullen's sign and Gray Turner's sign? Well, yes. Can you answer that one? Yes or no? OK. So let me tell you, actually, the positivity, a positive greater than a sign and a positive Cullen sign actually indicates that the doctor, that the patient has intraperitoneal bleeding. OK, a very, very important thing. You have to remember that there is intraperitoneal bleeding. So remember, if a patient is coming down with mid epigastric pain, also that has been radiating down to the back and with an increased threefold rise of the pancreatic enzymes like amylase and lipase, with a positive Cullen sign and a gray Turner sign, a doctor has to certainly, certainly suspect that there is some intraperitoneal bleeding. Do not ever ignore these signs because it is fairly a very, very clinical emergency. OK, so remember it that a presence of a Cullen sign and a greater than a sign actually indicates that, that the emergency of the intervention that is necessary to deal with this patient. OK, most of the times, yes, there are so many, so many other diseases that are also associated with inflammation of the pancreas, but fairly uh, differentiation of the pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis, along with the chronic pancreatitis, and also differentiating it from kind of a, a you know, formation of a pseudocyst in the pancreas generally has to be done with these clinical signs that is present. And we are going to look down for the evidence of an intraperitoneal bleeding on a CT scan as well as the inflammation around the pancreas. So that's the first thing what you are trying to expect uh, when you are trying to look down on a CT scan. So fairly speaking, yes, you have forwarded this patient down to a CT scan. Now let's try to understand the radiographic features so that it will be much So remember, pancreatitis is a clinical diagnosis which will be made in an emergency department, generally with, there will be a pain radiating down to the back, abdominal pain that is radiating to the back, along with the rise of the pancreatic enzymes, 300, sorry, three times uh, in threefold increase or three times increase of the pancreatic enzyme lipase, which is the most important indication for a CT scan. While you are trying to look down uh, on a CT scan, the doctor not only tries to look down along the inflammation of the pancreas, but also trying to look down for the complications like Cullen sign and Gray Turner sign, which is also called as the radiographic Cullen sign and the radiographic uh, Gray Turner sign, which actually suggests that there might be an intraperitoneal bleeding. So remember, one of the most important disease that actually causes a lot of intraperitoneal bleeding will be Gray Turner's sign. OK, oh, sorry, uh, is pancreatitis. OK, so how do we actually recognize? 
Remember, any kind of an inflammation will generally have the five signs of inflammation, okay, cardinal signs of inflammation. So even in here, in pancreatitis also, there will be a fairly an enlargement of all the parts of the pancreas, okay? Like last time we learned that there will be three parts of the pancreas, okay? It's the head, body, and the tail, okay? So the maximum surface area of uh, the pancreas will be actually given by the, uh, you know, the tail, so generally, you will start recognizing by the enlargement of the pancreas along the tail region. So that's the first thing where generally the normal measurement of the pancreas is 3 centimeters for the head and 2.5 centimeters for the body and 2 centimeters for the tail. So the pancreatitis patient will have a level beyond these measurements. So enlargement of the pancreas as a whole. OK, it doesn't matter if there is around the head, if it is around the body or if it is around the tail, but it doesn't matter where. But any part of the pancreas has been enlarged. You can fairly, fairly call it as a diagnosis of pancreatitis. OK, so look at this image here. First thing. You can see that the pancreas is a fairly a leaf shaped argon. OK, which has got an isodensity and uh, there will be no inhomogeneous densities in or around the pancreas if you look down on a CT. But here, what actually happens is that there will be increased haziness, OK, increased haziness around the pancreas and you in and around the pancreas, you can actually say it that way. Right. And the first important sign that you are going to look at here is OK, there will be enlargement of the pancreas. OK, the black arrow that is actually indicating that there is an increase in diameter of the pancreas. So. Also, the other thing you have to remember, whenever there is an inflammation, there will be some kind of an adiabatic fluid that is actually being uh, released down into the surrounding area. So we call such kind of a thing uh, or is like the infiltration of the peripancreatic fat. OK, so this is something more of an exudative release. So there will be peripancreatic fat. So you can actually call this one also as a sign called as the fat stranding sign. OK. OK. Uh, Nitish, you are asking about the characteristic features of the Gray Turner sign and uh, Cullen sign. Uh, you mean to say the radio radiological characteristics, or is it uh, the clinical characteristics? Do you want to say which one do you want me to explain? Which one do you want me to explain? OK, uh, yes, uh, first let me complete of the basic science. Yes, uh, because there is a little bit of a clinical understanding. OK, I'll tell you. OK, I'll, I'll come over. OK, yeah, I will. I will explain that one. First, let me complete of the basic uh, things first. And then, yes, I will teach you that one. OK, you have to see here. So uh, the enlargement of the pancreas along with the infiltration of the peripancreatic fat, which is also known as a fat stranding site is the confirmatory diagnosis of a pancreatitis. And you also have to see here that these findings are generally consistent with acute pancreatitis in a proper clinical setting. And the patient also should have markedly elevated levels of amylase and lipase. OK, so these findings are consistent. What are the findings? The enlargement of the pancreas along with the peripancreatic fat infiltration or a fat stranding or exudative inflammation fluid collections in and around the pancreas. OK, you can call it uh, anyway. OK, remember, it is the enlargement of the pancreas and also exudative inflammatory fluid collections in and around the pancreas. One thing. Or you can call it as inflammation, infiltration of the peripancreatic fat. Fair enough. Or you can also call it as the positive fat stranding along the pancreas. Yes, you can call all of them 
sound the same thing. All of them are indicating the same thing. It is nothing but your acute pancreatitis, right? Okay, so how do you actually start recognizing it? Peripancreatic stranding, okay, that is nothing but down your fat, fat stranding is it itself, okay? Peripancreatic fat stranding are the fluid collections in and around the pancreas, okay? The first thing, and generally, you also have to recognize that a pancreas is an isodense structure. There will be no any inhomogeneous shadows in around the pancreas. And what actually happens is that whenever there is a presence of a fluid, so what does actually fluid do to the any argon that is present in the body? What does the uh, fluid do? Fluid will actually try to reduce its density, yes or no? So there will be loss of density, okay, which is actually also called as a low attenuating lesion inside the pancreas in the form of necrosis, okay? Remember, when the trypsinogen, by releasing down the enzymes in the presence of enteropeptidase, is actually causing the auto-digestion of the pancreas, yes or no? So if there is an auto-digestion of the pancreas, yes, there will be a healing mechanism and there will be activation of a necrotic pathway so which is actually causing this low attenuation lesions okay so necrosis is also one of the clinical sign that is actually recognized by loss of density okay loss of density of these soft tissue structures of the abdomen that actually indicates necrosis so Low attenuating lesions in the pancreas from necrosis is also one of the most significant feature in recognizing the progression of the condition. For example, to say you have only seen the enlargement of the pancreas. So can you technically assess the patient and say that the patient will uh, develop down into the exudative inflammation and also develop down into necrotic stages in the later uh, time? Yes or no? Can you say it that way? Okay, if I have just seen only enlargement, which means to say the patient will eventually develop down the transudative uh, inflammations of the fat and eventually lead down to necrotic in the later stages of the disease. Yes or no? No. Okay, Dreshma, why do you think it's no? Don't you think that, see, let, let's say if the enlargement of the pancreas is there, it means to say the fairly overactivation of the pancreas has been happening, right? So if there is overactivation of the pancreas, which means to say the amylase and the lipase, which are the inflammatory mediators, will eventually rise down over time, yes or no? If the stimulus is being given more and more, okay? Don't you think that these enzymes will start off the autolysis process more and more? So why do you think it's no? Yes, if stimulus, yes. So what actually, yes, that is where your answer is lying. Okay, so you have to remo remove down the stimulus. So what exactly is the stimulus? What is the stimulus? <coughs> Stimulus is nothing but the food that is actually entering down from your gastrointestinal tract, which rarely goes down into the duodenum over time, which actually where the digestion actually happens, where there will be release of the pancreatic enzymes into the duodenum, right, by the cystic duct. So when there is no presence of food inside the pancreas, yes, of course, the whatever the levels that has been raised will eventually come down, right? So that's the reason in a pancreatic patient, we will be actually advising the patient par total, par enteral nutrition. Okay, remember the first step that actually a doctor prescribes for a pancreatitis patient whenever he's suspecting pancreatitis is nothing but nil by mouth. Okay, nil by mouth. We can also call both of them is uh, says the same thing. Okay, 
which is actually called as the total par enteral nutrition okay total complete par outside enterum gastrointestinal tract nutrition so how can i provide the nutrition to the patient without involving the gastrointestinal tract well simple it's just nothing but the infusion of the iv fluids okay so that is actually called as the total par enteral nutrition so which is also called as tpn or nm okay or nom you can call it as nil by mouth okay R N O nothing oral okay you can actually call nothing oral or total power antilla nutrition right now why i actually tell you down in this scenario here is that you can actually see is that the areas are non-viable of pancreas due to the early course in the development of the disease so what actually happens is to visualize that we actually have to remove the triggers of the inflammation first we remove the triggers of the inflammation by a total power enteral nutrition advice and that can technically be achieved by the complete lavage of the abdomen by insertion of an nasogastric tubes okay right what is the technical name for a nasogastric tube it's a riles tube right so insert uh, uh, insertion of the riles tube inside the stomach and then finally giving nothing by the mouth and then completely emptying the gastric contents to stop the procession of digestion right first remove the stimulus and then what we actually going to do is to stop the progression of the disease into a complicated scenario why because later on in later stages of the disease yes there might be an intraperitoneal bleeding okay so that's the reason we are going to start with the total parenteral nutrition first and then we are going to make the pancreas visible by administration of an IV contrast material, okay, which is generally iodine, okay? IV contrast material administration is generally given down to predict the prognosis, okay? But right now, uh, what are the prognostic factors, okay? What are the prognostic factors of hepatitis? Okay, remember, uh, can somebody tell me what exactly, uh, how actually, a, what is a prognostic factor? Can, does somebody have an idea what is a prognostic factor? Yes. What is a prognostic factor? No, I'm not asking which one is the prognostic factor. I'm calling what is a prognostic factor. Okay. Prognostic factor is a factor or a uh, any kind of a symptom or any kind of a sign of the patient, okay, which actually determines if the patient is likely to produce any kind of complication related to the disease or not. Yes, chances of recovery, right? A good prognostic factor says that the patient is unlikely to develop any complications. And a poor prognostic factor indicates that the patient will likely develop any kind of complications related to this disease. So what is the most bad prognostic uh, thing that might happen? What is the bad thing that might happen to this patient here? Okay, let us say I have a patient with uh, pancreatitis. What happens down in the macro level here? Okay, necrosis is a micro level thing. What happens down in the macro level? What can happen? What's the worst can happen? The first thing in an acute setup is actually the patient will be having unbearable pain. First thing, okay, there will be a lot of pain. Okay, and the second thing, 
No, disorder of digestion. When I'm trying to give nothing by mouth, where will be this disorder of digestion comes? See, remember, there is a very, very overactivated digestion here. It's not about the disorder in digestion. It is about overactivation of digestion. So in this scenario, even if you are going to give a very, very strong uh, material, yes, you are going to digest it. Yes, you are even digesting your own organs. So it is not a disaster of digestion. It is actually overactivation of digestion. Okay, yes, there might be an obstruction. Perfect. Okay, there might be an obstruction on a gross level. Okay, and then, yes, very, very bad thing may happen. There will be a bleeding, intraperitoneal bleeding. Okay, yes. So these are the first three things on a gross level. But on a micro level, actually, there are bad prognostic factors that you can actually recognize the patient might develop a complication or might not develop a complication. So bad prognostic okay, factors, bad prognostic factors are first elevated. Okay, remember a very important thing, elevated blood, urea and nitrogen. Okay, blood, urea, and nitrogen. And then age is greater than 55 years. Okay, and the patient has a condition of hyperglycemia. Okay, and then also the patient has hypocalcemia. OK, I will not get into the details of how actually these one are causing uh, the as the bad prognostic feature. But remember, uh, there is this criteria that is actually called as the Bishop criteria. OK, and Apache two criteria along with ransoms okay clinical criteria actually shows which of the patient will eventually develop the complications related to a pancreatitis okay remember there are three types of scorings in a clinical setup which is actually the bishop score the apache score and the ransoms clinical criteria are the ransoms score which actually the most important prognostic factors will be these. But there are so many other things too, okay? But the most important things are the elevated blood urea nitrogen, but we call it S, and then age greater than 55 years, and the patient has a hyperglycemia, or the patient also has hypocalcemia. So these are the most important prognostic factors such as that the patient might develop a complication. Now, let's try to recognize and let us try to differentiate the, these things from the complications or other clinical conditions, okay? Yes, is there any doubt here? Yes or no? Is there any kind of doubt until here? Yes, no? Okay. Right. Now, the first thing what we are actually trying to do is that recognizing an acute pancreatitis on a CT with a pseudocyst formation. How do we differentiate it? Yes, a pseudocyst is actually encapsulated with a fibrous tissue, a vault of collection of the pancreatic juices released from the inflamed pancreas. So remember here one thing, in case of a pseudocyst formation, there will be a fibrous tissue that is encapsulating around the pancreas. Uh, sorry, or you can say along that uh, this fluid collection which has happened down in the pancreas. So the lesion will eventually show up with a fibrous tissue that is encapsulating it. And then the wall of a pseudocyst is usually visible by CT and will actually enhance with contrast material. Okay, right? So remember, the most important recognizing feature here is that the pancreas do not have a capsule and it will not enhance, okay, 
on the contrast but here there will be a localized enhancement of the tissue which will generally enhance enhance in the sense yes it will increase in its density okay whenever i have given down a contrast material yes it will increase in its density so the fibrous tissue that is encapsulating the lesion where the fluids of pancreas have been released will enhance when after the contrast material is administered okay so remember here once you see here okay the pancreas is actually being recognized here while compared to the other image that what we have there uh, okay s is the stomach first thing and then we have the pancreas in around here so you see here there is a slightly a white density that is actually forming around this uh, fibrous uh, you can see this uh, localized lesion here. The first thing is that pancreatitis is not a generalized lesion, where a pseudocyst is a localized lesion. You can actually see that there is some kind of a capsule which is encapsulating some kind of a hypodense fluid inside it, right? So first thing is that you can actually see a localized lesion and having a fluid density. So by this, actually, I can understand that I am looking at the cyst. And the other thing is that generally cysts will have a very, very thin wall. So we call it as a pseudocyst because it has got a fibrous tissue encapsulating its wall. So that's the reason it is called as a pseudocyst. So there will be a fluid collection and there will be a fibrous tissue which is actually enhancing on the presence or the administration of a contrast material. Actually, how can I recognize if this is a contrast study or not? The first thing, the easiest way I can actually do is that I can look at the major blood vessel. Okay, this is the descending iota. I can see that the descending iota is so wide. Actually, I understand this is a contrast study. Okay. And yes, it is also causing whiteness of the shadow on the fibrous tissue. are causing fibrous density, so density with an enhancing fibrous wall tissue. that I am indeed looking at a patient of a pancreatic pseudocyst, a okay. pancreatitis. Is my voice still not clear? Is it not clear now? Still, still have the same problem? Is it clear now? Okay. Uh, then Okay, is it, it's clear now. Right? Again, for most of the people, it's clear. Okay. Okay, then. Uh, uh, we do have a minute o'clock or so. Would one thing a break of ten minutes now? Start at around like at twelve o'clock or around twelve. Okay. The the coordinator wants to know how you guys have been performing and uh, fairly poor attendance you see here i still have something around like uh, 40 students that did not attend the class today so attendance is very important i, I would like you guys to take uh, you know a little bit of attention for this one all right okay Necrosis and hemorrhage in hepatocellular carcinoma increase a worse stage of hepatocellular carcinoma. Is it just time of a sign of tumor killing? No, what do you mean by this question, Diabolina? Uh, 
uh, people who wants to learn about uh, the celiac axis can stay or other people can go if you do not have a doubt okay other people can go uh, if you do not have any doubts uh, people who have doubts stay down here even regarding the assignment and other things also you can stay down here and uh, people who wants to learn about uh, celiac axis stay down here okay yeah other people can go uh, what do you mean by that uh, Debalina? necrosis and hemorrhage okay in i mean hemorrhage indicates severity or is just a sign of tumor killing well okay you cannot uh, generally say if there is a hemorrhage are you talking about okay if there is a lot of hemorrhage in hepatocellular carcinoma does it mean to say that is it related down to severity or the progression of the disease yes or no right no you see uh hemorrhage in an hepatocellular carcinoma may be directly related to the number of uh, uh you know lesions and also the size of the lesion let us say if this lesion is big okay if the lesion is big what actually happens is that there will be more blood vessel neovascularization is the one that actually happens in uh, any kind of a tumor right a tumor growth will have uh, you know neovascularization there will be new blood vessels that are being formed right so big lesion more blood vessels more likely of hemorrhage multiple lesions more blood vessels means to say more likely of hemorrhage yes it might indicate the severity but it does not indicate the progression uh, sorry it indicates the progression but it does not indicate the severity okay what is the sign of tumor killing what do you actually meant by tumor killing what is tumor killing what do you mean by this line Tumor killing in the sense, are you talking about the tumor resection or is it something separate? Because I'm completely unsure what you are talking about tumor killing here. What is tumor killing? Please confirm which one, what do you mean by tumor killing? Benedict, are you here? Aman, Benedict, and other guys, are you here? Yes, Debalina, I'm waiting for you to explain your question. Or if not, I'm going to continue with something else. Okay, Benedict, are you here? Guys, ah, removal. No, uh, it is technically, no, uh, it does not indicate removal, okay? But uh, the 
amount of blood vessels are the one uh, that is uh, directly related down to the resection of the tumor okay the uh, amount of blood vessels will um, increase the amount of uh, hemorrhages during the resection so that is the only thing that might be related there okay but uh, it does not actually indicate the worst stage the worst stage of the hepatocellular carcinoma is directly dependent upon the number of lesions and the liver function okay maybe i'll better tell you maybe i think you can learn this one which is interesting okay which is actually called as child book c score okay which actually tells about uh, the hepatocellular carcinoma uh, progression okay it is called as child book score okay child book score is the one that is actually done for assessment of quality of life C score okay right uh, please uh, uh, look at that one which is actually that one actually that one, there is the one that suggests the severity or the progression or if it is a resectable tumor or a non resectable tumor or uh, wait since you asked this question okay i'll yeah, share uh, a thing with you so that you can actually give it a read uh, when you know about it Oh, so just give me a minute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe Jabalina, since you asked about this, once you look at this article, it is very easy to understand and fast to complete so that you can actually understand what is the one that actually determines the severity of a hepatocellular carcinoma disease. Okay. There is a pathophysiological mechanism I have included in this uh, research paper. Uh, it talks about uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and its pathophysiological mechanisms and severity of the child puck scoring and other things. Okay, I will try to transfer child puck scoring in the next time. Okay. All right. So do you guys uh, want to see about the celiac axis? Right, it is very easy and uh, very simple. Okay, yeah, the the guy who asked that one is he here or is not here? Benedict, are you here? Please let somebody know Benedict. Yeah, okay. Right, let me complete. It is uh, let me complete it in five minutes. It is very easy. Okay, not so difficult. Uh, I'm try. I will connect up my. Just a minute. Other guys, if you uh, guys do not have any doubts, yeah, you might leave. Okay. Uh, it's not a problem. If somebody wants to discuss about the assignment, you can stay and please give me a message and I can respond down to you guys. Okay. All right. See the whiteboard. Yes. Right. Confirm. Once confirm. Okay, right. So uh, let's talk about uh, celiac axis. Uh, not really so difficult. Okay, let us say this is the abdominal iota. Okay, this is the abdominal iota. Right, 
which is taking its origin at the level of T12. Okay. Now, abdominal aorta has got uh, several branches as it goes down. Okay. As the descending aorta, as it when it comes down as the descending aorta. So we have a stomach here, duodenum. Okay. Right. And then we have the greater curvature of the stomach. Okay, duodenum, right? So this is here. And somewhere here we have spleen. Okay, we have the spleen. Right? And then here in this side we have the liver. Right? So we have the liver. Okay. And we have gallbladder. Okay. We have gallbladder. Is this understood? So this is iota, spleen, liver, gallbladder, duodenum, stomach, where this is the lesser curvature, this is the greater curvature. And coming with this one, we have the Okay, we have pancreas like this. Okay, have pancreas. Got it? Right now? Okay, is this clear until here? Yes, Benedict? Right? Other guys, yes? Somebody who is listening, you tell me. Okay, right. Now, you see here, we have this one is actually continuing down as the esophagus. Okay, that's fine. Right. Here, from the abdominal iota, there will be two main branches that are coming out. Okay. Which is the hepatic artery, common hepatic artery. Okay. And you will be also, okay, you will be also getting gastric arteries, okay, which common hepatic artery has the two branches and it is one branch is coming down and here is continuing down as the splenic artery, okay, right, so first thing is the hepatic artery. So this one is common hepatic artery, okay? Then, which will be giving down another branch, which is the splenic artery, okay? So while the splenic artery is going along its path, it will be distributing, okay? Uh, don't confuse yourself. This is not anteriorly coming. This is actually coming posteriorly, okay? Posteriorly from the uh, behind the stomach, okay? This is behind the stomach, not along the stomach. This is behind the stomach. So while it is actually going, the splenic artery actually is going to divide down into three branches, okay? It is going to divide down into three branches, which are nothing but your pancreatic branches. Okay, pancreatic branches. Yes, then at the same point of time, here at this level immediately, first after that we have branches, immediately after these branches, what actually happens is that there is the one which is coming down as the left gastric artery, which is going and supplying the lesser curvature. Okay, this is left gastric artery. Okay, left gastric artery which is supplying down the coming the first branch that is coming down is the left gastric artery and is the supplying the lesser curvature of the stomach okay while it is also supplying the lesser curvature of the stomach it is actually giving down to two main arteries which is coming down to the esophagus superior esophageal artery and inferior esophageal artery so this is esophagus okay so esophageal artery Okay, esophageal artery here, right? And then 
Now, the other thing is that what happens is this common hepatic artery is going down into the liver, okay? This common hepatic artery is going down into the liver and becoming two main arteries or you can call it as, okay, this is common hepatic artery here, but it becomes a straight line, which is actually called as the proper hepatic artery here, okay? So it is called as the proper hepatic artery here. And while it is going down into the liver, it is going down into two main branches, which is actually the right hepatic artery and the left hepatic artery, RHA, LHA, okay? RHA and the LHA. Then the, from the right hepatic artery, there is another artery that is giving down to the gallbladder, which became down this cystic artery. Okay, so this became cystic artery. All right, see, common hepatic artery becomes the straight and becomes a proper hepatic artery. Then it opens down into the liver as the right hepatic artery and the left hepatic artery. Then from the right hepatic artery, there is another branch that is coming out, which is actually called as the cystic artery, supplying it to the gallbladder. Okay, then Immediately from the right hepatic proper artery, you will be getting one branch which is supplying again to the lesser curvature of the stomach from the inferior side, which becomes the right gastric artery. Yes, okay. From the proper hepatic artery, you will be getting down and running inferiorly and along the right lesser curvature of the stomach, which becomes the right gastric artery. So remember here, the left gastric artery is a branch of abdominal aorta, but the right gastric artery is a branch of proper hepatic artery. Clear? Yes or no? Are you following? Yes? Tell me, guys. Yes or no? Right? Okay. Then, you see here, we have got the common hepatic artery, right? So from the common hepatic artery, what happens is that it runs posteriorly, okay? It runs posteriorly behind and starts to form two major arteries, okay? Which becomes... <clears throat> which becomes superior pancreato duodenal artery, okay, which becomes superior, okay, which becomes superior pancreato duodenal artery, okay, and then also extends down as the greater curvature of the stomach on the inferior side becoming the gastric epiploic arteries okay it becomes the gastric epiploic arteries along the greater curvature of the stomach right then now what actually happens is that this splenic artery here also gets down into some other branches along the okay along the which actually comes down as separate branches, which is giving down into other epiploic arteries, okay? This is the, uh, let us say, this became the right gastric epiploic artery. So this one will become the left gastric epiploic artery. Simple, right and left. So right gastric epiploic artery is a branch of common hepatic artery and superior pancreatic duodenal artery. Left gastric epiploic artery is a branch of splenic artery. And smaller blood vessels are being come down here, okay? The other smaller blood vessels are also here, right? And then, that's it. That is what your celiac axis is. Simple. Did you understand? Confusing or 
it's easy. Do you want me to repeat? Clear? Okay. First, give a let me give a overall summary in a single sentence. Okay. See, abdominal aorta gives its branches down as the left gastric artery, which is supplying the left curvature of the stomach. It also gives two branches as the esophageal artery, superior esophageal artery and inferior esophageal artery. Mm -hmm. Then it also divides down as the common hepatic artery, which in turn divides down into proper hepatic artery and supplying down to the liver by right hepatic artery and left hepatic artery. The right hepatic artery has got a distribution has got its a branch supplying down with this gallbladder to these by the cystic artery okay then the proper hepatic artery bends and runs inferiorly along the lesser curvature of the stomach to form the right hepatic sorry right gastric artery right then the second branch of the abdominal iota is the splenic artery. While it is supplying down to the spleen, it gives down to three separate branches, which are actually called as the pancreatic branches, which supplies the head, body, and the tail. Okay, super. Then the common hepatic artery will actually runs posteriorly and divides down into superior pancreatoduodenal artery and runs posteriorly along the greater curvature of the stomach to form the right gastric epiploic artery. The splenic artery runs inferiorly and gives down a branch which is the left gastric epiploic artery. That is the whole celiac axis. That's it. Okay. Or do you want me to still go down below and talk about the mesenteric plexus as well? Want to learn mesenteric plexus or maybe just leave it out here? <laughs> no. Okay, mesenteric plexus is also not difficult. Mesenteric plexus is quite easy. Fine. Okay, we will try to deal about the mesenteric plexus when we are talking about the intestines tomorrow. All right. So this is celiac axis. Uh, remember one thing actually the article what i have included down related down to the acute pancreatitis is actually in that patient we have got an aneurysm in the right hepatic artery and we have got an aneurysm in the left gastric artery so both of them were there and the patient started to bleed because of pancreatitis that is present here and you see here the vicinity of the pancreas is quite close to the left gastric artery right and this one is the thinnest blood vessel that is present down in the lesser curvature of the antrum. So this one is more likely to rupture and it is very, very rare phenomenon. Okay, then splenic artery can rupture, pancreatic arteries can rupture, hepatic arteries can rupture, right? All the things. So celiac axis, a complete celiac axis evaluation has to be done in case of acute pancreatitis. Okay, all the blood vessels has to be looked. So well, it is quite simple. These are the major branches. So you try to remember only these branches. So this is actually called as the celiac axis. Right, clear? So I guess we are done. Right, so any other doubts? Assignment. Okay, what do you have with the assignment? Kya puchna hai assignment mein? What do you have? Shushanta is here. Is Shushanta here? Shushanta, are you here? Okay, what is your question? I technically did not understand. You sent me some images. I did not understand what is that question related there. So that's the reason.
So what do you mean by when we open them, it shows it's complete? Complete, when you fill up the answer and literally it shows, it shows incomplete answers. No, you see, actually you have to save as a new PDF, okay? When you have done the work, you have to save it as a new PDF, not incomplete answers. Inco it shows incomplete answers just because of reason, because you have not completed all the answers. If you have written all the answers, it will not show incomplete answers. Okay. When you write down all the answers or when you write down it, you say file and save as and save as a new PDF. Yes, that will show up. Don't worry. But when you are trying to save down the same image, uh, sorry, same PDF, it will show up as incomplete because it is necessary for you to answer all the questions. There is no choice. All the questions have to be answered. Yes. Did you understand? Save as document, save as. Okay, save as document. And then you can actually try to. Uh, save whatever the content you are, uh, that is there. In, it might be showing incomplete because you cannot uh, submit the article, uh, sub submit out the assignment without answering all the questions. Every question has to be answered there. And Sahil, you still have a problem with the class? Hmm. It doesn't have internet problem. So I don't know. Actually, you were talking about something yesterday. Okay. And I don't know who is this guy yesterday who talked to me. Somebody I don't remember the name. I wanted to see who is that guy. Is it Sahil or somebody else? I don't know who somebody was talking to me yesterday night and was talking about. I don't know the writing handwriting things or something something and he wants to impress me and he's worried about my impression rather than answers. So whoever are the guys writing down the answers for the assignments. Forget about impressing me with your colorful handwriting and colorful notes. OK, I'm poorly impressed with colors. I just only see black and white. And especially I want. The answers that make sense. At least makes medical sense. OK, I'm not worried about impressing. I'm not worried about handwriting and other things. I actually wanted you guys to write down in the type a digital format just because so that you can correct things later on. If you are doing it in handwriting, you know, you won't be able to correct it and you need to, you know, upload a lot of images, which is going to waste a lot of time. So typing generally, yes, it is easy. And I don't think that you guys can type slow. You guys are quite fast when you do the chat in Facebook and other things. So you, I don't think that your typing capacity is slow. But somebody who does not have an access to computer, yes, you can write it down. OK. Right. If you have an access to the computer, the answers are there in your slides, both practical and theory slides. The answers may be indirect, but still, if you have understood the concepts from the previous classes, you should actually complete it. You should be able to complete it. Right. And. A fairly a very simple, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, something like an awareness uh, thing. I could say the answers to your essay question. OK, the answers to your essay question is not direct. The answer should the essay question should be exact diagnosis. OK, don't give vague diagnosis. The diagnosis of the essay question should be exact. For example, to say if you are looking at light lobar pneumonia, write the diagnosis as right lobar segmental pneumonia. 
okay or if you are looking at a tb patient you try to talk uh, to write down the diagnosis as primary tb or secondary tb or tertiary tb or miliary tuberculosis if you are seeing it in the right uh, mention if it is present down in the right upper low bar primary tb or right upper low bar secondary tb or something something like that okay or lung cancer as well if you are looking at lung cancer don't write lung cancer because there are millions of types of lung cancers tell me if you are looking at an adenocarcinoma if you are looking at a small cell large scale or if you are looking at a squamous cell carcinoma so i want a specific diagnosis people who ever will write tb or pneumonia or lung cancer like this vague answers you will be losing complete marks because if you got the diagnosis wrong you will be writing your radiographic features wrong if you got your radiographic features wrong you will be writing your risk factors wrong so whole question you will be losing 20 marks as well okay did you get it is there still any confusion I don't know, Shushanto, other guys, Reshma, uh, Archana, Jabalina, Sahil, Pratiba, Clara, all these guys. See, if you have a problem with finding out the diagnosis, learn your concepts once again and read them twice and write down the specific answer only. If you are not writing the specific answer, you will be losing two marks there. Marks will not be awarded if you are writing it only TB. Be specific on the right side, left side. Yes, okay, if you are saving, okay, just saving it. Um, try to save as, and then save it as a new document, okay? It should be saved. But the problem happens is that you should completely fill out all the empty spaces. You can't leave out the spaces. Something has to be written. Right? So that's it, I guess. Any other guys? Anything else? Can you have more time for the assignment? Why? Any reason, specific reason, Munib? I think uh, I asked you guys, right, before? I think I asked you, right? Is one week enough or not enough? You were going a little thoroughly. Okay. How much time do you need? Yeah, exactly, that is fine. But how much time do you need? Of course, it's for the end of the week, isn't it? I put it till 7th, right? Till 10th. Tenth of May. And the lockdown is going to close on 17th. Then when are you going to do this gastrointestinal system assignment? When I'm going to check. I heard that most probably maybe after 20th. Okay. Maybe after 20th, the flights might resume. International flights may resume. Okay maybe after 20th, depending on the number of cases. So most probably you will be getting back down to the country, uh, the university, maybe something around like in the first week of, uh, you know, June or so. Okay, mostly, mostly. I'm not really so sure yet, but uh, 17th when the lockdowns is closed, most probably I heard that the flights will be resumed, right? mostly around the first week of uh, June or so. 
So we will be completing another two assignments uh, before June. So if you sti still keep on extending and extending of these times, I'm not really so sure. But don't even feel happy. But if the cases be go beyond 30,000, sorry, go beyond 50,000 by 17th, God save us. We are going to help, uh, you know, extend the quarantine for another 21 more days. That's what the protocol will be. Okay, so if it is going after after the next the, the last 21 days, if it is still the red zones still have uh, cases greater than you know thousand cases, thousand cases greater than thousand cases, 999 cases are called as the red zones. So if the red zones still have the highest number of cases, the new cases also coming it that way at increased frequency. Generally, the peoples in the red zones cannot be moved. They will be put down in the lockdown. But green zones and the yellow zones, yes, most probably they can resume their activities. But still, until the end of July, the educational institutions are not open in India. Okay, until the end of July, uh, the educational institutions are not open. Right. But uh, your educational institution is not present in India. Your institution is present somewhere out of the country. So if you are, uh, if you are present down in uh, these red zones, so even if the lockdown has been taken off, but international flights and uh, going out of the red zone may actually require special permissions, I guess. So international flight travel from the red zones may be restricted and you might have to stay down in the quarantine for at least seven days or so. I'm not really so sure about those protocols in your localities, but this is what happens in my locality here. OK, the people who ever are planning to go from a red zone to other countries or other places has to stay down in the quarantine for seven days. And then once they get the clearance, they will be moved forward to the place. OK, you need to talk down to your local health administration and police authorities about this one. So after 17th, yes, most probably I heard that. Yes, local flights in Delhi have already started. Yes or no, right? Trains and buses around Delhi areas have already been started, uh, but that is actually for migration purposes. But for international flights, uh, they will be starting yeah in this week i heard that in this week they will be starting down but after 17th if it is that way you know depending on the situation if the lockdown is over because i am expecting this to be the final lockdown because the you know the quarantine seems to be working okay it seems to be working but still uh, i'm not really so sure if it is going to get more more cases then i think uh, i think maybe those bus things are for you know for the local migrants from other people coming down and going down into local migrants or some i think maybe it's not for the people who live in the city not with the intercity transport i don't think that one they have started no they haven't right yeah for the labor that's true that's true but still, so slowly and slowly, people migrating from different, different places also will go on like this as a protocol. But educational institutions, theaters, and large gatherings and meetings, temples and other things, right? All of them, restaurants and all of them will not be opened until the end of July in India. But if international travel has been approved, you have to stay down into the quarantine. So you still might have to, you know, after 17th, I think maybe by the end of July, you will be having a complete idea if you will be going back to the university or not. OK. What about China? You see here, if there is no bus, if you want to travel from your home to the airport, why will you travel to China, man? 
okay even if you have a bike even if you have a car if they are not allowing and the airports are closed where will you go what about china oh condition in china condition in china yes it is fairly good now yes people have been resuming resume the schools from today yes schools have been resumed uh, the classroom teachings from today in china at few areas so but uh, compared to the situation in india i think uh, no we haven't but uh, european countries and uh, you know uh, united states i guess they have closed it till december because their con their cases are way too high right i think uh, you need to uh, you know uh, once also talk to saraswati online or uh, medic uh, your coordinators uh, how you will be going down back to china if the lockdown has been lift off and uh, then uh, uh, people from the red zones and uh, how the transportation and other things will be happening it right because this is what i'm guessing this must be the last lockdown in india but unfortunately if the cases go high in all the red zones for example to say right right now andhra pradesh and telangana seems to be one of the biggest uh, lockdowns lockdown areas so for me here i heard that uh, maybe not until you know august uh, nothing is going to start so we are still going to continue it the only thing that is going to open for us is the barber shops <laughs> after that nothing else will be open right no restaurants no movie theaters no schools no educational institutions no coaching centers right no movie theater the only thing what we have is that only supermarkets and uh, you know the ration areas local transport still no local transport we heard that they are going to still wait for the start of june even though 17th will be lifted off but still local transports and intercity transport or extra city transports will be completely co closed until june alcohol shop are you going to get me some <laughs> no i don't think so all right so but uh, however mm, so you want the time of extension till 10th shall we make it 8th eighth ninth tenth mein kitne fun rakha hai teen din ki farak hai see why are you trying to get it uh, more time is it something just because you cannot find out the answers or is it difficult to do no but so many other people have told me sir we have so many other assignments so how are other people managing you are studying the playback now i thought you have already studying the playback so many long time ago what so what were you doing before munib we have conducted three tests and you haven't seen the youtube video still today some other i'm sorry then no i'm not going to give you time for that because you are watching some other things i thought you were watching my videos i'm sorry boss you are watching some other videos this is not my problem
see if you guys have been following up the prep ladder videos or if you have uh, following up some other things that is not my problem all right you are wasting your time first complete your theory are abhi bola mera nahi hai some other bol raha hai abhi bol raha hai mere they are yours kaun sa hai kaun sa sahi manu main मेरा दूसरी वीडियोस क्या है मैंने और क्या लखाया था उधर हैव यू अटेंडेड माय क्लासेस लाइव क्लासेस मुनीब देन व्हाट्स द पॉइंट ऑफ नॉट एट नॉट ऑल yeah again that is not my problem then yeah see uh, even i told you that's not my problem also when you talk to me right see if you haven't attended the class early it means to say you have to find out the fastest way of doing it but not extending the time what about other guys why reshma was also asking uh, uh, extra time right i saw reshma asking extra time so what is the reason for it all other guys who are thinking of an extra time you tell me okay you can do something like this complete it on 7th okay complete it on 7th submission of the monitors and other things will be taking time right because the monitors has to still organize the papers collect he has to make sure that he has collected the papers from all the guys right so i guess he will be he will be taking like two days of time yes monitors monitors are you guys here monitors are generally taking one day to two days of time to collect those papers from all the guys to make sure that everybody is included right so maybe somebody can utilize that two days of extra time right something around like 9th okay because i am thinking if i have saturday and sunday or at least sunday so that i can actually look in what the things you have written that's the reason i have put down it on 7th so that i can discuss it on saturday and sunday at least on your free time because i know you are get, trying to get down and answers to these questions all the assignments and theories right i actually need to look down also it may take time for me too okay so complete try to complete it by 8th and submit it off to the monitors final by 9th okay right i expect something around like 60 to 70% of the students to submit it by 7th okay but monitors will take time to organize i know that monitors has to collect it from all other students right so complete it by mostly 8th and monitors will be submitting me on 9th get it yes monitors perfect i guess right monitors will be giving down will be on 9th collection will be on 8th okay all right perfect so answers find them from the slides they are in the slides if you cannot find out the answer try to learn the concept once again we will discuss the answers once i 